Well, I'm delighted to uh, tell you about our project, which is related to two photon uh, ophthalmoscope for human retinal imaging and functional testing. This project uh, has been directed by me and by Grażyna Palczewska, and we're able to recruit several experts in different areas of imaging, primarily related to safety, like uh, Francis Delory and uh, Alfred Fogel, and also to other aspects that were required to build uh, the to make a progress in our proposal related to metabolic two photon imaging, uh, human uh, instrumentation buildup, and excitation of light modulation, as well as functional assay and clinical evaluation. Uh, it, everybody on this list contributes tremendously to this project, but I would like to single out a few people. Uh, involved in this project, namely Eric Graton from the University of California, Irvine, and Dr. Andrew Brown, uh, who is a retina specialist in our institute, uh, who was extremely helpful for human imaging. And none of this work uh, would be uh, possible without a tremendous uh, help from uh, Maciej Wojtkowski, uh, who uh, helped in um, uh, human imaging uh, both uh, for light sensitivity as well as for imaging. The two specific aims that we proposed on the beginning of uh, this project were quite ambitious. And uh, I am delighted to report to you that both of those specific aims were fulfilled uh, through uh, those uh, passing years. First uh, specific aims was uh, to develop a mouse two photon ophthalmoscope uh, to uh, diagnose and functional to perform functional images uh, in uh, live animals uh, through uh, endogenous fluorophore that are related to retinoid cycle because retinoids, uh, particularly retinol and retinal ester and fluorescence, we can uh, utilize those property for diagnostic purpose of functional responses to light in live animals. The second was to develop uh, and test two photon imaging uh, that will have capability to quantify functional responses in humans. So both of those aims uh, were uh, successful, uh, we were successful in accomplishing and really open a new area of uh, two photon uh, imaging uh, exploration uh, for diagnosis and imaging uh, of uh, human retina in normal as well as disease state. The basis for both of those projects were publications, uh, prior publication, one in uh, Journal Cell Biology by Imanishi, uh, my postdoctoral fellow at that time, uh, who uh, applied for the first time to photon imaging to, human, uh, to mouse eyes. What he discovered is uh, a specific structure of the retina called retinosome that, con that are present in RPE cells. And this really opened up the possibility of images on subcellular level. The second paper was published in PNAS in 2014, uh, where we quantified and provide absolute proof that two photon can also cause isomerization of rhodopsin. That was a major breakthrough because it will allow uh, to uh, interrogate retina uh, with infrared light and to look for responses under condition where uh, infrared light can uh, combine, two photons of that light can combine in terms of energy and cause isomerization of rhodopsin and con pigments and evoke electrophysiological response. So this study again opened up possibility of testing using infrared uh, light of um, um, of visual function. Um, with the advantage, obviously, of infrared light is uh, better per, uh, uh, transmission uh, through even a, a very dense matter, and particularly with the aging eye, this uh, technology appears to have a potential as we develop later on, and we're going to show you in a second. So this both imaging as well as uh, uh, sensitivity are critical uh, for regenerative medicine because uh, the regeneration of certain cell types or implantation of uh, 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 RPE cells or photoreceptor cells or retina 
who required uh, imaging and required a, a sensing whether the um, implanted uh, part of the cells or tissues are sensitive to light. And I think this technology will be critical uh, to evaluate uh, particularly those uh, type of technology to rescue sight in uh, blinding diseases. So I affect our interaction with the world by collecting the light and converting it to electrical signal, which brain then interprets as a vision. And the same window that lets the light through through into the eye, it also allow us to investigate processes of retina at the bottom of the eye. And existing technologies such as SLO and OCT can provide us with the information about the structural changes to the eye. However, to assess the metabolic processes that sustain healthy vision or to assess the impact of, um, of the therapies, different, meta different methodologies needed because the existing methodologies would have to use the UV light, which is not only harmful, but only poorly transmitted through the front of the eye. We conquered that barrier, but by employing the quantum process, mainly the two-photon excitation. And in two-photon excitation, two lower energy photons do the job of the one high energy short wavelength photon. Thus, we can excite the molecules in the eye with the infrared light. After the two photon excitation, molecule can release the energy by emitting the fluorescent photons. And uh, how it happens, the pulsing lasers deliver a very high energy during the very short time, thus allow the two photon excitation. More, moreover, the, by controlling the temporal properties of the pulsing laser, such as time between the pulses or pulse duration, we can improve the efficiency of two photon excitation and thus reduce the average power that is needed to image those molecules in the eye. And this is extremely important for fully uh, non-invasive imaging of the processes in the eye. Furthermore, when using the fluor pulsing laser, we can not only measure the quantity of photons that arrive at the particular image pixel, but we can also measure the time delay between the laser pulse and the photon arrival. Thus, we can have the grayscale images based on the photon intensity, but we also can assign the third dimension to the image based on the fluorescence decay or fluorescence lifetime such that each molecule can have a different color based on the fluorescence decay. And this is extremely important for fully non-invasive imaging where we don't use any exogenous dyes because each molecule has the characteristic lifetime. So based on this, uh, on this principle, we assembled, we designed and assembled the system for imaging the RPE and the retina in the non-invasive way. But to do it in a really quantitative manner, we also use the phasor transformation for fluorescence lifetime, for, of the fluorescence lifetime. Thus, instead of the, uh, of the decay function for, the, for every pixel, we, have, we convert the decay function to the point on the Cartesian coordinates, such that each molecule will have their own place on the Cartesian coordinates. And such, we use, for, we use the mouse model of LCA, RP65 knockout, and determine the location of the retinal esters, which are collected with the <clears throat> retinosomes, such as shown here around the border of the RPE cells. To look at the distribution of the A2E, or retinal condensation product, we use the mouse models that, um, that uh, show deterioration of their exposure to light, and we determine the position of the A2E on the Cartesian coordinates by using the 850 nanometer excitation light because the retinal esters do not emit fluorescence in response to this excitation. Thus, when we use the 730 nanometers in this mice, we can see all the fluorophores in the RPE. And then we know the location of the retinosomes. We, don't, we know the location of the A2E 
and the points that are located between the retinosomes and A2E correspond to the mixture of those fluorophores. Taking this advantage, we can also quantify how many, how many particular components are in particular location in the, in the cell, in the RPE cell. Thus, we provide a non-invasive biopsy of the retinal fluorophores. And here, for, in, for instance, by selecting only the retinal esters, we can quantify the surface that is covered by these retinal esters in the RPE 65 mice and compare it to the mouse that is a model of the light-induced degeneration. And we got a very good color correlation between the, our imaging evaluation and between the this uh, and between HPLC measurements, which we know it's uh, fully invasive as the eye does not survive that. And uh, considering the volume here, we have a, uh, this, uh, this measurements by using the imaging is fully confirmed by HPLC. Another fluorophore that is present in the eye, it's the melanin. And here we found the signature on the Cartesian coordinates of the melanin by imaging, by fluorescence lifetime imaging of mice with, with melanin and in albino mouse. And here the, the very characteristic location is in the choroid because there is not that many other fluorescent uh, molecules in the choroid. And we can use that, that information to find the optimal wavelength, excitation wavelength for imaging retinal esters in the RPE. And we use the 730 nanometer, 750, 780, and found that we really have the good contrast between retinosomes and the melanin when imaging with the shorter wavelengths below 780. When we image with 780 nanometers, the contrast between the retinosomes and the melanin disappears. And in such a way, we can then image the eye in the living animal. And we show that the bright, uh, bright spots here in the gray scale image correspond to the red dots, which then correspond to the retinal esters in the RPE. And now, taking advantage of these discoveries, we have now obtained the first images in the human retina. And uh, you see here the two photon excitation fluorescence as well as the uh, uh, as this SLO image. And even though those are very preliminary images, you already see a different level of the details that are visible when we image with two photon excitation. And uh, here the kudos for this result go to Dr. Wojtkowski, who was um, instrumental in obtaining these images. Two, two photon excitation also offers uh, tremendous uh, advantages to measuring the function of the retina to measure visual sensitivity. Thanks to the IR, infrared better penetration through the turbid media, but also in two photon excitation, scattered photon do not contribute to the visual signal. And first to validate that, we obtained the data in the mouse retina and in the primary retina using the uh, speci specially constructed fixture where the retina is placed between the two plates and submerged in the solution that keeps it alive. And uh, during these measurements, we can also image the retina so we know exactly at which location the signal is obtained. And uh, on the right here, you see the plot. And as one would expect for one photon excitation, the sensitivity, the visual sensitivity drops with the increasing of the wavelengths. And um, we would expect it based on the world results that it would go all the way to 1000 nanometer or even longer that this visual sensitivity will increase. However, when employing the two photon excitation at around 780, 750 nanometer, we start seeing stabilization of the signal or even increase when we go to 1000 nanometer. Thus, based on these measurements, we can care that the signal from the macula, from the macula cons, can contain about 85% of uh, M cons and 15% of the L pigment. Knowing this, we constructed the system for measuring two photon uh, sensitivity in humans. And the system contained both the uh, visible light as well as the infrared light to measure the sensitivity. 
and to confirm that indeed the vision is induced by the two photon excitation, <coughs> we plotted the, the visual threshold to visible light as the versus the two versus the visual threshold for infrared light or two photon light. And we obtained the line with the slope of two, further confirming that indeed this is the two photon vision that we are observing. And, and, um, and this system also allows us to take the maps of the visual sensitivity at the pre-selected points on the retina. And here you see the uh, 2D maps as well as the 3D maps with the lowest sensitivity in the center of the retina. Encouraged by these results, we obtained the, prelim the data in a human subject, in larger sample of human subjects. And obtain also the, that the sensitivity is dropping with the age as expected because, uh, because the retinal processes in the back of the eye are not so great when, when, you are, when you are getting older. And as expected in the retinopathies, we have also the drop of the sensitivity. And we confirm that the two photon excitation could be used to measure the visual sensitivity in diabetic retinopathy pipe. Patients. Does, does um, this prove that um, that uh, this proof that really this two photon excitation to measuring visual function could be useful in the clinics? And there are a couple of things that make it useful. We observed that during these measurements, we didn't have to do any correction for the lens um, for the lens density as it typically done. Further confirming that. <coughs> IR light is not being scattered in the lens. And also we confirm that uh, patients is, didn't see any discomfort during the measurements with the two photon excitation. This was an extremely uh, fruitful, uh, fruitful period. And we have published 22 uh, papers in this project with the latest paper being just published today. And in the, Key publication here is the non-invasive to photon optical biopsy of retinal fluorophore, which we published in 2020. Then another papers in JCI Insight and TVST and in BOE. Furthermore, to spur the free discussion and um, pro to promote the progress in the imaging, we also organized the Irvine 2020 Retinal Imaging Colloquium. And it was the last meeting that we had in person in February 2020. Uh, it had a very, very good discussion among the experts in nonlinear imaging, retinal imaging safety, intravitial imaging, advancement in hardware and software, and in data analysis. Two photon imaging of the eye is going to stay with us uh, as a, one of the modality, important modality to interrogate the function and structure of the retina. We're very delighted that many of the technical issues have been resolved in the last uh, several years. And now uh, the next step would be to um, analyze and, and to test those uh, both imaging as well as sensitivity in cases of uh, human uh, diseases and also the potent, how the treatment of uh, those blinding disorders uh, can be uh, monitored by those two technologies. Uh, so two photon imaging is the um, imaging technology that will allow us to get additional information to commonly use uh, uh, imaging uh, modality like uh, OCT uh, that will uh, expand the repertoire and hopefully for clinicians to utilize this technology as we go forward. Thank you very much.